a very warm welcome to Friday Fretworks. First and foremost, just to apologise for the uh, lack of a video last week. Alas, it was my intention to get something up, but um, by the time I got home on Friday evening, it was about 9 o'clock, and the uh, moment had well and truly passed. So, my apologies. Um, back to normal this week, obviously. But, just to uh, give you some context as to why I missed last week's video, it's quite a cool thing, and uh, hopefully in the long run, will well and truly recompense for the uh, lack of a video. I've spent the week, um, or near enough the week, at Lick Library. Now, if you're not familiar with Lick Library, Lick Library are a company based in Romford in Essex, um, which for the majority of my youth, um, I pretty much bankrolled, I imagine, um, with the amount of backing tracks and DVDs and tab books of theirs that I bought. Um, a fantastic company just specialising in tuition stuff, basically. Um, and it's kind of been an idea that's been floating around for a while now, but it finally came to fruition last week. They invited me over to their studio to uh, film my own Chris Buck DVD, in essence. Um, obviously, I announced this on social media and I put it out at tender a little bit if there was anything that you wanted to specifically see me talk about. Um, we've covered a pretty wide, uh, wide range of topics and it is going to amount to about an hour and a half DVD of me talking and explaining some ideas, uh, showing you some licks and just generally kind of talking about the uh, the way I approach guitar. So it's a very cool thing and it's an immense honour given that I've grown up uh, you know, kind of watching DVDs made by Lick Library and playing along their backing tracks and learning tabs from uh, from the books they've produced. So that's a very, very cool thing. So um, apologies for the video not being there last week, but hopefully this will make up for it in the long run. So needless to say, when it's uh, ready to be released, I shall let you know and there should be links below and all that kind of cool stuff. But um, also just to get a little bit of housekeeping uh, out of the way, from the 11th to the 13th of July, next month, 2018, depending on when, what year you're watching this video, or Dave Catcher, um, I shall be doing the inaugural Bernie Marsden Guitar Experience at Stowe House in Buckingham, which if you're not familiar with Bernie, um, you will have definitely heard some of his work. For the longest time, he was the guitar player in Whitesnake, um, and amongst other things, wrote some of their biggest hits. Will for your here I go again. Um, all that kind of cool stuff, walking in the shadow of the blues, an incredible guitar player, an immense songwriter, um, and just a lovely guy to boot, to be honest. Um, and I'm lucky enough to call him a friend, and even more lucky to be invited along uh, to join him as a guitar teacher on this inaugural guitar experience, along with Jim Kirkpatrick, another phenomenal, uh, phenomenal guitar player, and uh, plays with Bernie and in a band called FM. And yeah, 11th to the 13th of July. Do check out the links below. There's one or two places left, so if you do fancy it, it's just basically going to be me, Jim, and Bernie for a couple of days showing you the tricks of the trade and all that kind of cool stuff. So uh, very much looking forward to that. And lastly, before I forget, um, I'm on tour in the UK with my band, Buck and Evans, from the 19th of August so far to the 21st of September. Not every one of those days, unfortunately, but we've got a couple of things lined up around the UK. 19th of August at Chepstow Castle with King King. Phenomenal Scottish band. Um, it's going to be a great gig. Um, from the 23rd of August, we are in Birmingham at the Hare and Hounds. Uh, 24th of August, I put the Clooney 2 in Newcastle. 25th of August, we're at the Garage in Glasgow. And the 21st of September, we're going to be at the Hoxton Square Bar and Grill in Shoreditch in East London um, for our London album launch. And then we'll have some South Wales stuff coming up as well later in the year. So, uh, yeah, very excited to get out and actually get this album out on the road and play some of the songs off it. Because, uh, yeah. It's been a long time coming. So uh, anyway, without further ado, this week's video uh, is something that I get a lot of questions about and it's something that I've actually talked a little bit more in depth about, I guess, um, on the Lick Library DVD that you should be uh, seeing soon. But it is how I write solos, for want of a better phrase. Um, the hint here being that I don't write solos. Um, and it's very much, for me at least, it's a very organic process and it's something which... You know, I've never written a solo in the sense that I've sat down and kind of worked it out note for note, you know. Um, it doesn't really kind of flow that way for me, and it never will, I don't think. Um, but it's obviously a process which I guess a lot of people are interested in, and specifically my take on how I go about structuring a solo, um, how it ebbs and flows, and maybe how I try and tell a little bit of a story throughout it. So that is what this week's video is going to be about. I've used Sinkin, a track from Buckingham's forthcoming debut record, um, at the start of this video, and we're going to try and de deconstruct that a little bit. I'm not going to do a note for note kind of thing. Obviously, there's going to be certain licks we'll kind of lean on. Um, but it's not going to be a note-for-note -note thing so much as it's a conceptual study of how I go about trying to build it, I guess. And as I said, telling a little bit of a narrative and telling uh, the arc of stories. So um, I hope you get something out of it. As ever, if you do, please do subscribe. Uh, check me out on all the links below, um, as well as Buck and Emmons. We're very excited to get this album finally out. Um, and as ever, I shall see you next week for another episode of Friday for Outworks. Cheers, guys. So, the first thing I want to talk about in regard to building a cool solo um, is context. Context, context, context. You can't stress it enough. Which, in this case, is just a fancy way of saying be aware of your surroundings. 
um, know how long you have to solo in, uh, what the band are doing, um, trying to match that, you know, musically, make it melodic, make it interesting, make it just dynamic and something that builds and tells a story. Um, that is the way I approach pretty much every solo I've ever done, um, at least since I understood that concept. Um, and that is just, you know, the kind of key foundation of any kind of great solo for me is just telling a little bit of a story, which I appreciate when you put it like that, can sound a little bit pretentious, but. Every great solo does it, even if it's just instinctively or subconsciously, you know, even if a guitar player isn't necessarily thinking like that. It's something that happens in every great solo that I've ever heard. This tension, this release, this drama, this, you know, kind of like, as Ariel Posen put it recently when I was talking to him about this, it's kind of like the three acts of a play, you know. It's um, just building an arc of a narrative and telling a little bit of a story. As I said, context, be aware of what the band are doing. A solo is meant to be melodic, it's meant to be, you know, kind of like... I don't know, musically just dynamic and interesting. It's not meant to be a dexterous display of everything you can fit within a confined space of time. Um, so that's hopefully what I'm gonna try and break down for you um, and show you how I go about it. First thing worth mentioning about this track, um, incidentally, I've mentioned it before, this is a track called Sinking, um, which is gonna be on the Buck and Emmons album coming out later in the year. Um, it's a part of our track anyway, the solo obviously. Um, but the two chords we're gonna be working with are E minor and A major. Two things definitely worth mentioning are the notes in which I'm going to be leaning on out of those chords. Obviously, the overall key is going to be E minor, so we're just going to be etc. etc. But within those two chords, we have your root, your third, and your fifth. So this is your root, we're going to have your fifth, and we're going to have your minor third. And those three notes are the best notes in any chord, major or minor, which outline the kind of, you know, the voicing of the chord. Um, exactly the same then in A major. Your root, your fifth, and your third. They don't appear numerically when we're playing them as kind of traditional bar chord shapes. You'd have to be doing more of a... <laughs> um, kind of piano voicing, I guess, for that, but uh, that's by the by. Um, as I said, those notes are going to be the ones which I'm going to try and kind of, even again, if subconsciously, I'm going to target throughout the solo, just a little, you know, build a little bit of a sense of kind of tension and release. Release being when you land on the kind of the relevant notes, um, the tension being in those moments where you're not kind of landing on them. And in, in that in itself, you know, it's telling a little bit of a story and building a little bit of a narrative. So, best place to start is the start, which, as you guessed, is just an E. So hopefully, first thing you notice there is I'm landing after the big on the root, on the A, over the A chord. So straight away you kind of set yourself up a little bit, and it's not building tension straight off. The, the you know the last thing you want to do is kind of introduce that kind of it's like dichotomy, I guess, is straight away. You know, it's not going to be pleasurable, uh, pleasurable for the listener, or pleasant. Um, so. Basically outlining a couple of notes out of the A major chord to land on the you know the key that we're playing in or the note that we're playing over our. So and again landing on the root of the chord that we're playing over. So it's kind of building that sort of sense of progression whilst kind of confining yourself to the, not to the root notes per se, but the relevant notes within those chords. Obviously any note in E minor will work, but there's certain notes which are really gonna kind of outline what you're playing that a little bit better. Um, so. So we've worked our way back down to the root on that last bit. Next bit is interesting because we're starting to introduce something a little bit more rhythmically interesting, I guess. Two things worth mentioning. Rhythmically, that's very repetitive, which I think is something that kind of guitarists avoid in solo is repetition, but for me, it's a total essential. 
um, just because it builds a little bit of a sense of melody and just you know something that is memorable riff if you think about it you know any great rock riff is repetitive that's you know what becomes inherently memorable to the listener is because it's repetitive you know so near enough identical something like that again that little lick to finish off is pretty much a repetition of what I've just done so Not, interestingly, this time ending on the root. So we're not kind of ending on a... I think it would have rounded it off a little bit nicely, uh, too nicely if possible. Um, and you know, not kind of just, at this point you want to be introducing a little bit of a sense of kind of tension, I guess. Like I said, it's a weird way of putting it, but it's the way that I've always thought about it. So I'm gonna land on down from the root on the G. Two reasons, A, like I said, introduce that tension, B, really nicely and land back on the root and kind of resolve that tension straight away as soon as the minor chord comes out. So, next thing really worth picking up on is up until those notes, we'd had a pretty fluid run working your way down from the bottom of the neck up to about here. Something like that, at least. And the reason that's important for me is because we've had kind of we've had a pretty fast flurry of notes that if you kept that going would just be a little bit much at least to my ear it would kind of you know it's nice to show we can play fast and all that kind of stuff but again thinking melodically thinking dynamically and thinking from a perspective of trying to make it enjoyable and melodic leaving that hang is just a kind of a very very important part of solos um so Next bit, interestingly, we're picking out the major third. Which in this case, because it's an A major we're looking for, it's going to be a C sharp. Again, we could have chosen any one of three notes there. Could have landed on E, obviously the E being the fifth. Or C sharp. Third, or we could have just landed on, could land it on the root. You've got a kind of a nice choice of notes there to kind of really pick from. But for me, the major third had not really kind of leaned on that too heavily up until this point, so I thought it'd be a nice chance to try and introduce it. So break that down a little bit again this isn't going to be a note for note thing um I'm not the greatest with tab and i'm definitely not the greatest to remember it is what it is that i've just played um but we're pretty much just running down just an alternate way of playing huh. just the E minor scale and it's just a kind of fairly repetitive run up or down rather and then consequently back up that which leads me to one of two real kind of pivot points within the solo um, and for me personally I guess this is the most important part of the solo in that it punctuates it punctuates it rather it's something definitively different um, and it's a real kind of memorable moment that you know, I kind of really build towards. It's a, a pivotal moment, even if every other note of the solo is different, these are the two bits which I will kind of build towards in the solo as being essential. And that is... Two reasons. A, it's something I've not really kind of leaned on up till this point, rhythmically. And B, again, it's landing on... 
comes landing on that major third, which just resolves it in a really nice way. It starts to develop a little bit of kind of, you know, again, not to put it too kind of uh, existentially, but it starts to kind of make the, the you know, the listener realise that you're not going to leave them hanging. You are going to kind of resolve things when they need resolving. So... really kind of big moment in the solo um, and as I said even if every other note up until that is different I'll really make a point of uh, leaning on that during the solo so to be honest I can't remember what comes after that I remember the next big moment is working my way back up Pretty much the next big moment of the solo, which again is um, a kind of defining moment of it, I guess, being those big bends right up on the 22nd fret. Something. Ah, we missed a bit. Love it. However many times it does it. Again, it's not a particularly complex thing. It's just... Working your way down an E minor scale. But the reason for which is interesting, at least to me, is that it happens multiple, multiple times. Which, again, sets up, sets up a little bit of a sense of uh, familiarity, I guess. that kind of building of tension um, just because it's it's getting kind of increasingly faster and it's just uh, you know a cool little kind of rhythmic uh, nuance to lean on so as I referenced earlier that's the next kind of big moment for me is that Interestingly, again, landing on after that, which if you work your way all back down, work out to be a C sharp. So that's over E. It's that major third. They are the kind of really pivotal moments in their solo, and I guess the rest of it is just kind of making sure that you kind of keep building that, building that energy to the moment when the solo's down. And I think to finish, maybe it's uh, kind of... Again, kind of building a little bit of tension. Over the A. The most obvious place to do it would be actually do it in the key. The whole point of that bit is wanting to build a little bit of attention, um, building back into. So, there's a couple of things that I thought would be worth mentioning. Um, hopefully that gives you kind of some insight into what I'm thinking. Main takeaway points from this, um, a really kind of sense, you know, build a sense of progression. Tell a story, um, say something interesting. Don't just use it as a chance to kind of, you know, I know my pentatonic, pentatonic positions in all five shapes, and I'm going to let you know within the first 40 seconds of this solo. That's not what it's about, and the temptation is always there to kind of make it a lick thing. Again, think melodically. Um, it's a cliche, but think how a singer would approach this. And if you're a singer, you don't sing by kind of, you know... Uh, as much as there are those moments in the solo, 
really kind of making a point of building up to those um, as opposed to kind of starting with them and the old cliche is kind of you know don't blow your load straight away kind of build into this make it a sense of progression make it something interesting that develops as the listener uh, listens and take them on a journey take them on a journey take yourself on a journey and just enjoy it you know make it something that is interesting to listen to and interesting to play um, and hopefully you'll be on to a winner so um as I said, it's a little bit of a kind of tough thing to cover, I guess, because it's a conceptual idea so much as it is a kind of, this is what I play note for note, which wouldn't really achieve anything apart from you actually learning this solo. Um, but it's just trying to give you some insight into what I'm thinking when I'm doing a solo. So, uh, as ever, thank you very much for watching. If you did uh, enjoy this, please do subscribe. And uh, I realise this is a second outro on the video, but um, I shall see you next week for another episode of Friday Fatworks. Cheers, guys. Imana. <laughs>